Welcome to Revolutionize Your Retirement Radio, bringing you insights and strategies to help you create a magnificent and fulfilling second half of life. Here's your host, certified professional retirement coach and best-selling author, Dr. Dorian Mincer. I want to welcome all of you to my fourth Tuesday Revolutionize Your Retirement interview with Expert Series. I'm Dory Mincer. I'm your host and owner of Revolutionize Retirement. So without further ado, I want to introduce our guest, Connie Swag. I've, Connie's been on the program before, and let me just tell you a little about her. She's a retired psychotherapist and former executive editor at Jeremy B. Tarsher Publishing. She's co-author of Meeting the Shadow and Romancing the Shadow, and author of the bestseller, The Inner Work of Age, Shifting from Role to Soul, and a novel, A Moth to the Flame, The Life of Sufi Poet Rumi. She's been practicing and teaching meditation for four, more than 50 years. She's a wife, a stepmother, a grandmother, and is in the process of her own shifting from role to soul. And I interviewed Connie when her Shifting from Role to Soul in a Work of Age came out, and it's a phenomenal book. And this book is very different. It's a phenomenal book also, very different because it's focusing more on the shadow and some of what happens both as we age, but also what happens in sort of our spiritual longing and the way our involvement with our own shadow, with our own spirituality evolves as we're growing older. It's a very important and helpful book, and I think so timely, Connie. So I'm so delighted to have you here and to be my guest again. And I know your book just came out. It's called Meeting the Shadow on the Spiritual Path, The Dance of Darkness and Light in Our Search for Awakening. Why don't we start by you just telling us how this book came about and how it connects with maybe some of your prior books and work, and we'll start with that. Thank you, Dory. So glad to be with everybody today. As I'm, some people call me the shadow expert because I've spent my career exploring the personal unconscious, which some people call the dark side because it's not in the light of awareness. And meeting the shadow and romancing the shadow explored our unconscious process in politics, in relationships, in social issues, in creativity. And then when I went into my late 60s, I wanted to really apply that to aging. And so the inner work of age explores how we meet the shadows of age, those part of us that are in denial, the parts that are unacceptable to us, that sabotage our more conscious intentions. And I realized at some point that there weren't really, there wasn't a lot of writing about meeting the shadow in the religious and spiritual domain. We all went through the 1980s Catholic Church child sexual abuse scandal, which continue to this dead church continues its payouts in various dioceses. But I couldn't really find depth psychology or how the unconscious operates in the religious and spiritual arenas. So I had written an earlier book called The Holy Longing, which was about how our spiritual yearning can lead us to practices and teachers, to transcendent positive experiences, and also to painful difficult, even traumatic experiences. But that was before the Me Too movement. It was before a lot of cultural changes had happened. And so I really expanded on that book and revised and updated it to include not only Me Too, but also everything that's happening in the culture now around spiritual awakening. And so interesting to me, Dory, that <clears throat> there's so many really difficult and frightening things happening in on the planet, so many interconnected crises that we all know about. And at the same time, there are many people who are having spiritual breakthroughs. 
<laughs> and profound insights about the interconnectedness of living things, experiences of non-duality or unity of life, and that those things are happening simultaneously. And so <clears throat> I wanted to offer this book as a contribution to try to understand some of the cultural issues, the psychological issues, and the spiritual issues around shadow and religion and spirituality. And I think you've done an amazing job. The thing that so impresses me, Connie, is the depth of your exploring the inclusiveness of looking both at all different religions and spiritual practices and bringing in Freud and bringing in Jung and bringing in other aspects of psychology and spirituality of, of focusing on it. Your book is just so incredibly grounded. I do want to comment on that. What is it about? First of all, maybe just talk a little more about what is this holy longing that you're talking about and how does it awaken in us and how does it operate that gets us sometimes into situations that aren't so good for us? And sometimes very yeah. good for us. You're saying it's both. That's, but, <laughs> that's a great question. Yes. So many of us have noticed, maybe even from a young age, that we feel a restless yearning. Some people experience it as a whisper. Some experience, some have an image like a longing for home or a longing for God a longing for the divine or spirit, whatever our name is, for that thing that's greater than us, that's beyond ego. And if we read in the spiritual traditions, we find that the saints and the poets all speak about a longing for union with the divine, however they imagine that. <clears throat> they might imagine it as Jesus or as emptiness in Buddhist language, or as spirit in more non-denominational language. But there is this poetic sense of longing, yearning, return. And so I experienced that, I would say, consciously, starting at age 19, when I learned Transcendental Meditation. And as I began to explore, I realized that it's quite a universal feeling, and it can lead people in very positive directions. It can lead them to find a lineage where they feel at home in their religious or spiritual life. It can lead them to find community and a sense of belonging. It can lead them to find a teacher who's compassionate and wise and a practice that they can use throughout their lives to commune with something beyond ego. But at the same time, the human shadow is a part of human nature, and it doesn't go away. And even in people who have advanced levels of consciousness or advanced spiritual attainment, there is often shadow material that goes unprocessed. And if your longing leads you to someone who has authoritarian tendencies or to a group that's controlling and coercive or to a teacher who has a personality disorder, whose psychology is not really cleared or whose moral development is missing, then what can happen is that you experience that person's shadow in three different ways. Generally, there's power shadow, money shadow, and sexual shadow. And so as I began to research this, I could see the patterns of those three shadows erupting in different teachers around the world, teachers who are renowned, who we have known about in the past, and also teachers who are younger and in the current generation of leaders in spiritual communities. 
and I could see them acting out their shadows in ways that are very harmful for their students or their parishioners or their believers. And so even if they've taken a vow of no harm, they may be doing things that are really destructive to the community. And so I wanted to try to understand that. What leads us to charismatic teachers? Why do they act out their shadows? Why do people stay with them even in abusive situations? How do people decide when to leave those situations? And all of that became my contemplation, my research for the last couple of years. And I believe I gained some insight into what's going on that I really wanted to share with people. So let's, I really truly do recommend the book as a way to get at part of it. But so tell us, what is it that happened? What is it about our shadow that we project onto teachers or clergy and why do we do it? But maybe even before that question, maybe just even just some definitions of You've said it a little bit, but what is a shadow? What is projection? I think it may be helpful for listeners just to have your sense of how you define these terms, and then we can go into some of what you've learned. Yes, let's be sure we're all on the same page. The shadow is that part of us that is outside of our awareness. It's in the shadow rather than the light of consciousness. And so anything at all can be in the shadow. If when you were growing up, you were told that anger was bad, a lot of your feelings of anger can be banished and buried into the shadow. If you were told that sadness is not acceptable, like my father felt like he was a failure if I was sad. And so I learned in my family from a young age not to show my unhappiness. And sexuality might be shamed. Let's say in a church community, your your bodily impulses might be criticized. So those can be banished into the shadow and go unexpressed for a long time. But also a lot of positive talents and aptitudes can be repressed. So for example, If your family is very academic and they focus on education, your athletic gifts may be buried in the shadow courage or supported, or your artistic gifts can be buried. And part of what happens at midlife is some of this shadow material starts to erupt and people begin to feel regret about a narrow range of feeling that they've lived with or a narrow range of creativity. And they begin to allow some of this material to come into awareness. And the same thing can happen in a late life identity crisis. When people are in their 60s and 70s and they're retired, they may begin to feel, oh, I didn't really ever explore my creativity or my grief, or my independence, whatever it is, at those moments of transition, midlife identity crisis, late life identity crisis, these qualities can erupt from the shadow, even in adolescence also. And what happens in a spiritual context is that we find a teacher, we enter a church community, or an unaffiliated, a mystical community, or Jewish community, or we find a Swami or a Roshi. And we, as we enter that community unconsciously, we begin to notice that there, we learn unconsciously that there is a spiritual persona that's acceptable there. Just like in our families, when we narrowed our range of feelings, There's a spiritual persona that's acceptable. And so what happened to me is I noticed that everybody looked beatific and they looked happy because they were meditating and they wanted other people to meditate. And they put on a persona that looked like they had equilibrium 
and happiness and nothing bothered them. And as a result, more material gets buried into the shadow. And this is an unconscious process. We don't know that it's happening. And at the same time, as you mentioned, we project onto the teacher, which means that we unconsciously attribute to him or her certain traits that we don't accept in ourselves. And it might be our own spiritual light or essence, our spiritual nature, our Christ nature, our Buddha nature. And we attribute that to the leader. She's so compassionate or he's so wise and I'm not. So I need him in order to, I need to be close to him in order to experience that. And so we develop a relationship which in some ways is like a parent-child relationship. And we begin to give power, authority, in some cases, decision-making, values to that person in the position of power. And unconsciously, we begin to put ourselves into a more subordinate position. And many people in these situations go into service to the teacher. They work for free or for a small stipend. They give up their lives and move to the community and they serve the, the teacher and the community. And they get more and more invested in the projection and in the leadership of that person. And so that projection then is intact. And what happens to the teacher or the leader in that position? He or she is then carrying all of this projection. It could be from a dozen or hundreds, or in India, it's millions of people. They're carrying the projection of millions of people, and guess what happens? They start to believe it. They start to believe their own specialness, their own entitlement their own power, and their egos begin to get grandiose. Okay, if all these people really think this about me, then I must be entitled in some way to sit on a golden throne or to have 10 Rolls Royces or to own all this property around the world or to take my students' money. I just heard a story of a teacher who started out asking for tithing and then asked for a portion of his student's income and then asked for, when the student's parents died, asked them to turn over the estate, the family estate, to the teacher. And so this sense of entitlement starts to happen and it can creep into any area of life. In some cases, the teachers will begin to sexually assault or abuse or seduce their clients. They could be men or women. They could be female students or male students in some cases with male teachers. And so sexual secrets then develop in the community. And what I found, Dory, is that there are patterns in this abuse across denominations. And the patterns are very much like uh, alcoholic families. And this was shocking to me. In alcoholic families, there's a narcissistic parent who's drinking, who may be physically or sexually abusing someone, who's in some way violating boundaries, and ask that person uh, to keep the secret. And that's what happens in spiritual and religious communities. So then the secrets become the glue, and they hold these roles in place and these systems in place and these systems, the institutional systems, as we've seen in the Catholic Church, then collude with the abuse. And rather than supporting whistleblowers, they collude with, they support the abuse of leaders. Okay, so suddenly there's a student or a believer or a follower or an acolyte who's in this position. 
what is she going to do? First of all, she has an identity crisis. Who am I now? I was a follower of this perfect person. If this person isn't perfect, if he's really an alcoholic or a sexual abuser or a financial abuser, who am I? Am I a victim? Am I a survivor? Am I a bystander who's witnessing this and not speaking up? How do I become a whistleblower and tell my truth? And it's a very painful, difficult period when a student begins to meet the shadow of the teacher. It's really a crisis, a spiritual crisis, a moral crisis, an emotional crisis. Should I stop there? You've just said so much, and I want you to, if you will, expand more on it. But maybe, so you've painted the picture of what can happen with the religious or spiritual leader. Talk a little more, if you would, of what goes on inside us people who, what is it that you mentioned a little of it in terms of the early, the authority and seeing parents maybe in godlike ways or teachers in godlike ways, but what happens in in ourselves and in our shadows that people can lose themselves so readily? Because I think we really are seeing so much of this in our society and world. And it's it is it's frightening, both politically as well as through the spiritual and rel- religious institutions of people in power misusing their power, but also people being so stuck and paralyzed that they aren't able to envision a way to get out because you, you just have to buy into it so much that, it, as you were saying, it's you that's wrong or something. So what happens in the person that maybe can help them move from lost in it and doubting themselves to maybe becoming a whistleblower or at least extricating themselves from the cult-like kind of existence. You mentioned politics, and I really believe that Trump has created a cult. And so if you want, we can talk about the similarities. But let let me respond to your question. Several things are going on. One is that in, if there is a parental projection onto the teacher, if the teacher is a good parent compared to the biological parent, then the person gets very invested in having it be that way and having it remain that way. For me, what I recognize in retrospect is my first spiritual teacher was a shadow of my father. He was the opposite. He carried all the opposite traits of my father. And yet, as the TM movement grew and developed, He became more and more like my father. He became more materialistic. He became more angry. He became more controlling. And at a certain point, it became intolerable for me. So what was it that was intolerable? And I think in some ways this is different for different people, but there are some generalities, some general statements we can make. If people are evolving in their own psychology in these communities, if they are becoming more independent, then there is a tension that develops between wanting to think for yourself, wanting to have your own full range of feeling, and the dependency that's being required, the obedience that's being required of you. If the teacher is requiring more and more obedience, but you are beginning to question and experience some critical thinking or some feelings that are not acceptable, then there is a te- that it, there's an internal tension that develops there. And that's when people can start to doubt and question, is this right for me? Is this acceptable to me? Is this supporting my development? There are really distinct lines of development, and I really learned this from Ken Wilber and his integral philosophy. He realized at a certain point that 
our spiritual development is not global. We, be, we, we may have awakening experiences, but that doesn't mean we become a, a great musician or a great communicator or even highly morally developed. If our psychological development is different from our spiritual development, which is different from our emotional or moral or cognitive development, then what happens in that moment of doubt is we start to see that the teacher may be spiritually advanced, but not morally developed Mm -hmm. or even emotionally developed, doesn't have good relational skills. And I've had experiences with a number of teachers who were very advanced, but very emotionally undeveloped. And it was heartbreaking for me because I had close relationships and I realized in one case, this man was very sexist. In another case, the man was very emotionally inexperienced and morally undeveloped. And when you start to discriminate among these kinds of development, you can see your teacher more clearly or your clergy person, you can see more clearly. And so this moment happens of doubt, of questioning, who am I in relation to this person and who is he or she? And if in fact this person is a rageaholic, can I accept that this is my spiritual teacher? Or if he is sexually assaulting women, can I accept this in this community? And so we begin to reclaim the things that we projected. If we projected our spiritual power and decision-making onto him, we begin little by little to take it back. If we've projected our authentic feelings and lost certain feelings or our connection to our bodies and our bodily sensations, we begin to take them back. And then we start to see this teacher differently with less projection and more perception. And if we've projected our agency, our capacity to act on our own behalf or on behalf of someone else, we start to reclaim that and feel once again our own capacity to act. And this is what I call spiritual shadow work. And this is what the second half of the book is about. And so if we begin to reclaim our critical thinking, our authentic feeling, our bodily sensations, our agency, then we stand in a particular moment in relation to that teacher and we say, okay, this isn't working for me. I need to tell my truth, and I need to separate. And it can be a very painful period. For me, it was heartbreaking with my first TM teacher. It was devastating because I lost my meaning and purpose. I lost my community. And that community, that sense of belonging for some people is primary. You ask what keeps people there? For many people, it's belonging. And they just turned a blind eye to everything else because they have the family that they never had. And so if you are questioning and beginning to reclaim some of these parts of your own self, then you can cultivate the strength to separate. And Dory, for other people, that's not the answer. For other people, they want to stay and redesign the system and confront the teacher and see if the teacher can be accountable for his shadow. And so I tell stories in the book about communities that were able to do that. They were able to bring in outside consultants and do communal shadow work and redesign the systems that were abusive. From For me, I'm not saying that there's a, a prescription and answer that's the same for everyone. 
there's very individual needs here and individual responses to the situation. And I think the but examples. Are, yeah. Oh, go ahead. No, go ahead. You go ahead. No, go ahead. What were you going to say? No, I'd rather you finish what you were saying and then I'll ask or comment. <laughs> There's communal shadow work for some communities. That's a possibility. And then there's also individual shadow work and how we respond to that and whether we stay or whether we leave. It's a very individual decision. Right. So what enables somebody to tie into maybe the spiritual and the spirituality and aging question, what you're describing of either a person or um, a few people in a collective to have the wherewithal to begin to question, because I think that's very hard to do. What has to happen inside that enables somebody to reclaim their sense of their own self, I think, their own thoughts and beliefs? Maybe that's tied into what you talk about as spiritual integrity. Can you talk a little about that? Because it just it's, seems very complicated given our need to belong and our need to be part of something to somehow feel like we can still believe or have a spiritual yearning when we're rejecting something that has been so important to us? Yes, it is complicated. And I do want to relate it to age. So let's not forget about that. So for, and actually, let's do that right now. So for okay. some people, there's an innate resilience that they can call on. So for me, I was in my 20s when I started meditating. And there are lots of interviews in the book of, from people who've gone through this. But for me, when I saw the hypocrisy of Maharishi having sex and telling people to be celibate, of amassing wealth, and buying Rolls Royces and property around the world. And when I saw members of my community starting to lie about their spiritual experiences in order to get new meditation techniques, it just became too much for me. It just, I hit a limit and that hypocrisy just turned me off too much. Now, millions of people stayed. They didn't have the same limit. They were able to rationalize for many years. No, this really isn't happening. No, it's all rumors of people trying to sabotage him. He's sending the money to India to help people. And I call this spiritual rationalization. Because what happens in these communities, and there are many examples of this, Chogyang Trumpa Rinpoche and the Shambhala community, there was massive rationalization about his alcoholism and his verbal abuse and his sexual abuse. And then his disciple who inherited the community and actually had AIDS and lied about it and gave mm -hmm. people AIDS. And that was rationalized. That's how strong the defenses are to protect against the imperfections or the meeting with the shadow of the teacher. And with Rajneesh or Osho, if you there's a fabulous movie about his community called Wild Country, and you see the rationalization, the defense, and then you see it break down. You see the defenses break down as the community really starts to decompensate and the teacher decompensates. By that time, he's using drugs and he's extremely paranoid. And if people need to defend the teacher, then it takes time. They're also defending themselves, Dory. They're defending their own choices. They may have spent decades. And I had people say to me, if these rumors are true, then I have nothing. And my life, I wasted my life. And these defenses are difficult to pierce. And it's painful to pierce them. There was another story in which a woman in a Tibetan Buddhist community was being sexually abused and was witnessing sexual abuse. 
and a friend of hers outside the community just said three words to her. That is abuse. And she woke up. She couldn't frame that to herself inside her own mind. She couldn't name it as abuse because her whole reality would have fallen apart. And yet, once she heard those words, her defenses came down. And I think for each person, there is a different, there are different psychological defenses and mechanisms going on. And there's a different time frame for when the denial breaks down, when the projection pops, and when you can see clearly what happens. If you grew up in an abusive family and you're being re-traumatized, that can make it harder to see through the denial. Because you're used to it. It's a familiar pattern. It resonates in your nervous system. There's different timing and there are different reasons that people can break through. In terms of the response, there was a disturbing story that I heard about the Dalai Lama. Because there is a lot, there are a lot of reports now of sexual abuse in the Tibetan Buddhist communities. It's widespread. In fact, there's even a group of scholars called Religion, the Religion and Sexual Abuse Project. They're studying this now. Why is this happening? And a bunch of Tibetan Buddhist survivors took a document to the Dalai Lama that they called Nitu Guru. And the Dalai Lama said, oh, I knew this. I've known about this for years. So how is it possible that he knew and he didn't do anything about it? What are his defenses against action? He wasn't in denial. But it seems, and he's not abusive himself, and yet it seems to me that he was colluding with the teachers in his empire because he didn't want it all to fall apart. Because the reports of abuse were so widespread, it could have meant the end of the Tibetan Buddhist teachings of the lineage in the West. So he was defending that. Now, is that understandable? It is. Is it acceptable? I think different people will have different responses to that. Is it also true that he has tra transmitted unbelievable compassion and valuable teaching for the people of Tibet and for the whole world? He's been an amazing teacher. And yet, look at that. There's that little piece of his psychology that was stuck, that was paralyzed, that couldn't act. And there's that part in all of us that doesn't want to know and doesn't want to do anything about it and doesn't want to say. And I think we learned a lot from the Me Too movement about what it takes for women to come forward in the workplace and in the military to be whistleblowers. It's difficult. It's really difficult. And it's a very... In oh. Yeah. No, go ahead. Sorry. No, please. No, you said ahead. it's difficult, and I just finished your sentence, and then I'll... And it's a very individual process. We can't okay. prescribe it for other people. Right. But we can give the guidelines for spiritual shadow work, how to reclaim all this projection, and how to stand in our own power and our own resilience, and eventually speak our own truth. What you're saying is so important. And I, so it does make me wonder, because I think as we get older, many people who either further a spiritual path they're on, maybe change the direction or open to it in a different way. And yet all these things are going on around us. Does it feel like does that interfere with spiritual awakening for people? Or do you think that with the awareness of the Me Too movement, of what's going on in both institutional religion as well as spiritual groups, that people 
still are feely, they have the wherewithal to want to figure out what's important for them? Or do you think, are you finding that people are more afraid now at this stage of life with everything that's going on in the world, politically, as well as religious and spiritual, spiritually? So let's talk about this for later life, because it's so important, and it's probably most of our audience here. There's a popular phrase, completing unfinished business. What does it mean to complete spiritual unfinished business? I don't really see that spoken about very much. As we move into later life, as we face our mortality, what is our spiritual unfinished business? So it seems to me that many people have beliefs that are not serving them at this stage of life. Maybe these beliefs are creating fear of death. Maybe they're creating guilt or shame. Maybe they're creating regret about choices. So how do we examine our religious or spiritual beliefs so that they really fit who we are now, who we've become? I'll give you an example. I had a client who was a Buddhist practitioner, and he believed in Buddhism, but he couldn't figure out why he continued to have so much guilt and shame about sexuality. And in this case, he was gay, and he was in later life, and he came to me because he couldn't believe that he was still having those thoughts and feelings. And we began to excavate his religious beliefs underneath the Buddhism, what was in the shadow. And what we uncovered was an image of a white bearded man shaking his finger at my client, telling him he was sinful and bad. And this was an archaic image from his childhood in Catholicism which he really thought he was rid of because consciously he didn't believe in Catholic um, precepts anymore. But unconsciously in the shadow, there was this message that he was bad and sinful. And so we needed to do spiritual shadow work in order for him to align with who he really was today as an elder and as someone who really deeply wanted self-acceptance. These beliefs that we've carried with us, some of them go unquestioned into our later life, and they're having impact on us now. What about our beliefs about death? What do we carry through the lifespan in terms of our feelings and images and beliefs about dying and death? Isn't it important to really begin to uncover that now as we face later life and then the end of life? We want to align our beliefs about death with our whole life experience, maybe with our spiritual experiences and insights, rather than just allow them to fester and be there on the deathbed with us, creating fear. So that's another aspect of spiritual shadow work. Maybe if we do a life review, we recall what Reb Zalman Shachter Shalomi called a severe teacher, a spiritual teacher who betrayed us or hurt us. And so... How do we work with that now? How do we find reconciliation or healing with a difficult spiritual experience like mine, like the one I described, or someone who is sexually assaulted by a spiritual teacher and traumatized, or someone who is lied to by a clergy person, or someone who is stolen from by a clergy person? How do we give and receive forgiveness in later life so that we're not carrying that into the last moments of our lives? 
that's completing spiritual unfinished business, all of those different parts, and probably more, because individuals have different experiences of this, right? I had Absolutely. a number of people say to me, I feel betrayed by God. And it reminds me of the story of Job as he faces one loss after another loss. And we face a lot of loss in later life. We could lose our beloved spouse or a child or a special friend. And we can feel betrayed by life, by the universe, by spirit, by God, whatever we call that. And how do we work with that so that we can find peace and equilibrium in later life? And so completing unfinished spiritual business as elders is really essential. And I wrote about some of this in the inner work of age. And I also wrote about spiritual shadow work in the new book. I'm, it's not framed so much about later life in the new book, but it's completely applicable to those of us who are elders now. Can you give a, 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 any kind of an example of how one might, I'm just speaking about some of the people on the call and the fear of death, the fear, perhaps people who don't really know what they believe or are aware that they don't believe in God. And how, how might people approach this so that they can open themselves to more of their own spiritual integrity? Again, this is so individual about the teachings of different traditions. And they may find something that resonates with them in that way. <clears throat> because today, the mystical dreams of all the traditions that used to be secret, esoteric, they're all available now. Mm -hmm. And if you identify with being Jewish, you can explore Jewish mysticism. Or Christianity, you can explore Christian mysticism. Or Islam, you can explore Sufism, or Vedanta, or Buddha's, different Buddhist traditions. So you can explore and see what resonates with you, and see if there is a practice that speaks to you, that calls to your longing. Because for me, in terms of making peace, with death and sort of the ever-changing nature of life, it's about experience more than ideas or beliefs. It's about the direct experience of who we are. And if you find a meditation or a prayer practice that fits for you, and you have that experience even once so that you know who you really are, you can carry that with you on your deathbed. I've been doing, I've been sitting for more than 50 years now, but I've been doing a practice that I made up for myself, Dory, which is that each time I exhale in my meditation, I imagine that it's my last breath. And I let go and let go as far as I can. I inhale again with gratitude, and then I exhale that it's my la imagining that it's my last breath, and I'm letting go. And that practice has brought me deep intimacy with my breath and a familiarity with letting go. And a kind of peace around preparedness, a sense of preparedness. Now, we don't know what's going to happen. I still could have a difficult dying practice. We have no idea. But this is, this little practice is giving me a sense of equilibrium around that. And each person can do that for him or herself. You can imagine a practice, create a practice and imagine that moment and just begin to prepare. It's such a beautiful example, Connie, of you know, controlling the parts we can or just beginning to 
That's right. To, to open yeah. and prepare. And I think yeah. it's just, it's a beautiful example. So Bob from Pennsylvania says there's definitely a spiritual awakening that's going on right now. Some people seem to have difficulty processing what's actually happening. But he was saying people are more and more attracted to cult leaders. And he, he was bringing it back to the political situation, such as Trump, as a way to find clarity. Can you comment on this? Uh, I, I guess the underlying question, which could be either political or just in general, is what it is that people are seeking in the, in a cult-like community. Is it clarity? Is it the belonging? You've commented a little on it, but I wonder if you could just respond a little more to that question. I think it's a good insight. I think the there is a tribal quality to the culture now. And people are seeking their tribe. And in some cases, it's extreme cult. And I think that one of the shadow issues that's drawing people to cult is that our cultural persona, our cultural myth is the independent Horatio Alger. I can pull myself up by my bootstraps and do everything for myself, right? And the shadow side of that is dependency, childlike dependency. And so people are now acting out that secret hidden desire for dependency, to become a child again, and to be told what to do, <laughs> and to be told how to think, and how to feel, and what not to feel, and what not to do. And so there are these leaders rising up around the world who are, Biden calls them autocratic, but they're dictators. And people are drawn to them because they're drawn to being told what to do, how to obey, how to think. And therefore, they don't have to face the uncertainty. There's terrible uncertainty these days. There's uncertainty with the climate crisis, with social justice issues, with guns, with heightened racism and anti-Semitism. And if you have somebody who you think knows it all and will tell you what to do, you can relax and become a child again. And so that has always been a deep strain in psychology, in the psychology of humanity, that wish to regress and to be taken care of and to be told, what to do. So that's part of what's going on. Mm -hmm. I think that the, yeah, you want to say something? Oh, no, go ahead. I think that the, the cult mentality around Trump, the reason that it's so immovable is what we've been talking about. There's an intense projection and the projection is a savior. And it's an interesting paradox because he cultivates this image that he's a victim and many of the people who believe in him feel victimized by immigrants, victimized by poverty, victimized by joblessness, victimized by progressive values, feeling that they're being replaced, their culture's being replaced. And yet he becomes the savior. He's like a victim savior archetype, I would say. A rescuer, maybe that's better. Mm. And the sort of white nationalism that carries so much racism and projection within it, he's come to embody that very openly in the culture. And it's very frightening to people. It's frightening to people who see through it. And it's in very many ways very similar to religious communities. His narcissism is similar. His grandiosity is similar. All the gold in Mar-a-Lago and the chandeliers and the private plane. It's very similar to some of the shadow issues that we see, even the way he takes money from people, the lies around fundraising, the pathological lies that are going on from him and his co-leaders. And even the felonies, I think there are 70 felonies now, charges, 
don't have an effect on his followers. He's Teflon. And that's exactly what happens with religious leaders and spiritual leaders. It's exactly the same dynamic. So we're seeing it played out now on the world stage. And it's very disturbing. And I think it's really important for each of us who is committed to our own development, to our both our psychological and our spiritual development, to be to cultivate shadow awareness, mm-hmm. to be discriminating in who we trust and who we believe in, to cultivate our own moral development because we see such a lack of moral development and corruption around us. It's important for us to cultivate our own moral development, to learn about what that is and what it means to us as individuals and families and friends, to talk about it with families and friends in the context of moral development, whether about politics or religion or spirituality or your workplace, your CEO or your friends. And I really don't see that happening much. When you see a conversation about moral development happening, I really don't see that much. I don't either. But I think what you're saying is such a wonderful response and so important for us to think about. And it's it's that parallel of opening to ourselves and opening to that moral sense. I think it's tied in with what happens as we get older, too, of this sense that there's so many scary things going on, as you say, politically, in religious yes. institutions, spiritual institutions, the climate, guns, there's so much. And it is so important to claim ourselves and be able to think about how we want to live our life, how we define the good life, the giving back, the legacy, the kind of making the world safer. And I think it's tied into spiritual awakening and moral development. I think you're right. There needs to be more dialogue about that. And if you are an elder activist engaged in any social political causes, see if you can bring up the issue of moral development and how it's playing out in your community or with the leaders of the community so that there's open dialogue about that. And if you were more of a contemplative elder, bring that up in your own church community or unaffiliated community. I've recently been teaching workshops on meeting the shadow on the spiritual path, and a lot of clergy have been coming, Dory. Mm -hmm. In my last workshop, I had two Episcopal priests who are leaving the church now. One is retiring and one is leaving. to connect with their, and they're going to form a community around Episcopal clergy who want to discuss the shadow in their church. This, and I had, I've been, people from the Unitarian communities have been reaching out to me. I think that whatever community you're in, if you're an elder who's living in a senior living community, you can use this book as a discussion about your lifespan and your relationship to your holy longing and your spiritual or religious beliefs and how you need to reimagine them now. And that's something that I wanted to offer as an invitation to Pete, to our listeners. I'm forming three online groups for people who want to do spiritual shadow work together in community. And you can email me, ConnieZweig at gmail.com, and put in the email spiritual shadow work in your in the subject line, and be sure to give me your time zone, and I will connect you with other people in your time zone who want to read the book together and do the practices and really explore spiritual shadow work as a way to complete spiritual unfinished business. That's a wonderful offering. And 
is it on your website or so just say again because I know a few people have asked for your email say again your email so my and... email is Connie Zweig c-o-n-i-e z-w-e-i-g at gmail.com and if you're interested in a book study group just put spiritual shadow work in the subject line and be sure to give me your time zone I'm in the process of setting up groups right now, so it won't take long. You'll hear from me, and you'll be able to just go through the book and really have deep conversation with other people, contemplate these questions, and begin to to really work on your spiritual unfinished business. Thank you. And why don't you tell people also your website and how to be part of the because you have so many different workshops and different things you're doing, maybe let people know how they can sign up yeah. and, and be on your listserv. The website is com. There are lots of interviews and podcasts posted there. I have several um, workshops coming up on the new book, Shadow and Spirituality. In July, I have several workshops coming up on the inner work of age. They're all online, and so you can um, find out about them and see the links there. If you would like to receive my newsletter, again, just shoot me an email to Connie'sWag at gmail.com and just ask to get on my newsletter list. Great, thanks. Any last thoughts, takeaways that you know, now that you've mentioned how people can be part of the group and learn more about your things? Just a final takeaway before we end for today? I'm so grateful to you for what you've done all these years to support elders in transition around retirement and entering later life, Dory. And as I underwent that transition myself, I would I feel so so much gratitude to be able to meet people on Zoom now when I'm teaching, to be able to hear people's experiences and see your faces. And I would love to see any of you at my workshop. And I wish you well. I hope that my books are meaningful to you. And I just wish everybody well. And I thank you deeply, Dory. Oh, thank you, Connie, for being you and for being here and sharing so much of the wisdom that you have in all of your books. and. I really do recommend both the inner work of age, shifting from role to soul, and your newest book, Meeting the Shadow on the Spiritual Path, The Dance of Darkness and Light in Our Search for Awakening. So thank you for being here, Connie, and thank you everybody for being here and listening. And stay well and safe. Take care. You've been listening to Revolutionize Your Retirement Radio with Dr. Dorian Mincer. To learn more about the resources mentioned on today's show, listen to past episodes, or download our free retirement transition guide, visit revolutionizeyourretirementradio.com.